Welcome to part four of Shoulder Macro Instability in the Pomerantz Mentor Series presented by ProScan Medical Education Foundation. Now in this section, we're going to continue our discussion of macro instability and throw out some of the nuanced terminology, the descriptors that you're going to use to address the various pathologies you're going to encounter. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the, the classic findings, the ancillary findings that you see with a dislocation like the hill sacs fracture, the hill sacs equivalent, which is a more low-grade bony injury that you can only see on MRI. We'll show you the classic Bankert lesion, an antero-inferior lesion associated with a true dislocation. And then we'll get into some of the fancier names that we use to describe for some of the Bankert equivalents or Bankert wannabes. So let's get started. There are a few additional descriptors that, I, that I'd like to review when we're assessing patients with instability syndromes. Fraying or scuffing, which means very light irregularity of the superficial bursal or undersurface of the labroligamentous complex. Detachment, separation. You can also have vertical tears through the labrum, which means they run up and down. You can have flap or parrot beak tears, just like you do in the knee, that are more curved. You can have radial tears that truncate the free tip of the labrum. You can have labral chondral avulsions, in other words, separation of the labrum from the hyaline cartilage. You can have labral osseous erosions, separation of the labrum from the underlying bone. And finally, the periosteum may strip away from the underlying bone, a phenomenon commonly seen in the anterior portion of the scapula. So back to some clinical definitions. Macro instability. This is somebody that has instability with documented dislocation or locking. Micro instability. It's all the other forms of instability, but without dislocation or locking. And then functional micro instability. The, pa the patient has the sensation of diminished cohesion diminished strength, diminished power, but they experience a click or a clunk. And at the moment of that click or clunk, they feel like their shoulder is not solidly placed within the glenoid cup, yet on physical examination, you can find no evidence of instability. Let's start out with one of the cardinal signs of a dislocating shoulder, one that you're all familiar with from your plain x-ray experience, the hill sacs lesion. The hill sacs lesion used to refer to a fracture, a fracture that was V-shaped, looks a little bit like a tomahawk chop. But on x-ray, all we could see were fractures. Today, we can see contusions and microtrabecular injuries. So now we use the term hill sacs equivalent. Where do we find this? Near the apex of the humeral head in 90% of cases, usually about 10 to 20 degrees off of that apex. In the sagittal or lateral projection, it is found more posteriorly, often as an area of edema or a compression micro fracture or a hairline fracture. And here it is again in the coronal projection on a water weighted sequence, showing the full extent of the defect. There's also a small piece of cartilage floating in the blood filled joint capsule. Look at how much different this tissue looks than the adhesive capsulitis, which was more of a fuzzy, ill-defined high signal. This is a clear, smooth, homogeneous, and distended area of high signal intensity. No, this is fluid. And in the cases of adhesive capsulitis, you are seeing fibroinflammatory tissue. Now, the Hill-Sachs lesion is associated with another classic lesion called the Bankert lesion. And there are two types of Bankert lesions. There is the soft Bankert lesion that involves the softer part of the labroligamentous complex. In other words, you tear the labrum and or the ligamentous complex with it, but involve no bone. There's no fracture. And then the hard Bankert, in which there's a documented fracture. Those can be a little tricky on MRI, especially if the fracture is just corticated bone. Here's an example of a Bankert lesion with a loose fragment. This one's a soft one. 
the bone of the glenoid has its nice pointed shape. This is the fat weighted image. The bankard lesion is surrounded by higher signal intensity dilute blood, which is usually the case in an acute dislocation. On the water weighted image, the bankard lesion is seen as a very large fragment. Now there's a caveat, and the caveat is this. If you have somebody who is a recurrent dislocator, they will grind down the bone. Even though the bone hasn't fractured, it'll become flat and truncated. And a common mistake is to read that as a bankered fracture or a hard bankered, when it's nothing more than bony remodeling. So you have to see the detached bony fragment on either MR or X-ray or CT to read a hard bankered. Then finally, anteroinferiorly, we see plastic deformation or stretching of the joint capsule from the dislocation. And along with it, blood that has raised and lifted and made ill-defined and thick the scapular periosteum. So many things are displayed here. Periosteal elevation, thickening yet stretching of the inferior capsule, a soft bankered fragment, and a hemarthrosis. Here's another example of a soft bankard. This one is a little less distended in the inferior capsule. The capsule is folded on itself. But the definition of a soft bankard is a tear in the labral ligamentous complex or a tear in the labral ligamentous complex that involves the periosteum but does not involve the underlying bone. This one goes right through the relationship between the labrum and the bone, not involving the bone, and enters and ruptures the periosteum where extensive bleeding dissects medially on the T2 spur and although a little less well demonstrated on the T1 weighted image. The T1 weighted image is also a little less revealing in the separation and tear between the labrum and the underlying glenoid. Here's yet another example, but this time we have taken a piece of bone right here. You have to look very carefully because the amount of edema in the acute setting, especially when the fractures are eccentric, may be less than you expect. You also must have a very heavily water-weighted sequence to see this edema. The edema is not all that obvious in the medullary bone. In fact, the fracture in my estimation is more obvious on the T1 weighted image where you see medullary bone here, then a space that looks like a river or a divide, and then the medullary bone again. So everything from here on down is off. The labroligamentous complex is still attached to the bone. The labroligamentous complex still attached to the bone. There is your horizontally oriented antero-inferior hard bankered fracture. And yes, the capsule is distended. And yes, the signal on the T1 is higher than muscle. Therefore, you are looking at dilute blood. Let's take a look at some diagrammatic examples of the labral lesions that are associated with instability. And I'm primarily referring to macro instability, dislocation or locking. On the left is the normal labroglenoid relationship. The bluer tissue represents hyaline cartilage, which may slip underneath the labrum, may blend indistinctly into it, or may stop abruptly. But I'm only showing you one variation. The hyaline cartilage of the humerus, the joint space, the capsule, and then the continuation of the periosteum on the scapula. In the classic bankard, there is a tear usually at the base of the labrum through and through, often involving the adjacent periosteum. The definition of a soft bankard lesion is a labral tear through and through, or a periosteal tear through and through, or both. On the other hand, a bony bankard, as we've discussed, is a lesion that involves the bone. It could involve the cortical bone, which would make the case very challenging on MRI, but frequently it takes a piece of medullary or spongy or endosteal bone with it. The reason this is important is the treatment may differ for a soft bankard and a hard bankard where an open procedure and a screw may be placed 
depending upon the size of the fragment. Let's look at some other Bankert wannabes or Bankert equivalents. One of these is the Perthes lesion. In the Perthes lesion, the labrum itself is intact but is lifted away from the glenoid and a space or pouch forms. There is swelling of the periosteum. It peels away from the scapula, but it's not broken. So it's a closed space. Fluid, mucoid tissue, and blood may accumulate here in this Perthes pouch. When it occurs in the back of the shoulder, it's called a reverse Perthes or Kim's lesion. These shoulders may or may not be unstable. The double lesion. In the double lesion, the labrum has separated from the underlying glenoid. There is also separation of the capsule from the labrum. There are two abnormalities present, thus the designation double lesion. In a triple lesion, there is labroglenoid separation. There is the labroglenoid separation. There is capsulolabral separation. And finally, there is periosteal separation right at the base. Three processes going on at the same time. Thus, the designation triple lesion. And then finally, we conclude with some, some more difficult Bankert wannabes or Bankert equivalents. They're not true Bankert lesions because remember in a Bankert you must tear through the labrum, not just separate it, you must tear through it, and or you must tear through the periosteum. In these cases, we don't have those criteria met. Let's start out with the GLAD lesion, the glenolabral articular disruption. There's also another one called the GARD lesion or glenoid articular rim divot. I'm going to show that at a later date. The GLAD lesion is a partial tear of the labrum, not a through and through tear. It's a longitudinal tear that will often leave a small flap at the base of the labrum, which may fold outward and inward in internal and external rotation, and the patient may experience a click. The ALPSA lesion, the anterior and often antero-inferior, labro-ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion. The labrum is separated from the underlying glenoid, but the labrum itself is intact. It may be balled up or scrunched up as it rolls medially underneath the elevated but not torn periosteum. This medialization may occur antero-inferiorly or straight underneath in the axillary region, creating what's known in the axial projection as the disappearing labrum. And then finally, the opposite of the Alps lesion, the polypsa lesion, in which there's separation, and that separation is often associated with a little less migration, but there still can be, although not depicted here, migration of the posterior labrum medially underneath the elevated scapula. The pulpsa lesion is kind of considered the opposite of the Alps lesion. Later on, you're going to hear about a few other bankered wannabes like the polypsa lesion and the ellipsa lesion. I think that's enough for now. I've enjoyed chatting with you about what's a difficult subject, but one that's coming together in this most challenging of joints, the shoulder joint that has virtually 360 degrees of motion, thus making it one of the more challenging mechanical structures to evaluate. Thank you.